I have a three prong approach. First, it needs to start from the bottom uh, in terms of messaging from the CEO and leadership, right? That these are things that are priority and that need to be prioritized by the different departments. You have to be proactive. You know, you can't be scared. If you are an employee that knows of a potential risk, you should be bringing the, or potential issue or development, you should be bringing that up to the different teams that you're part of. Um, and so, you know, again, starting with the leadership and com the communication, having that communication, the second piece I would say is um, making sure that you are, um, what's the word, operationalizing and documenting your compliance efforts. Because again, there's risk in everything. So what you wanna do is document, operationalize as much as you can. You can't just have a pretty policy. I love writing those, but if you are not operationalizing it within your company, then when you have an inquiry from an, from an agency, you're not able to demonstrate that you had your best efforts based on the resources that you had available or the knowledge that you had available. And the last thing is, you know, we were talking about of companies launch being very close to launching a product and then having to halt because of a potential regulatory issue involving legal around like from the beginning. And I know legal can, can is known for stopping things, but really, if you educate legal on what you're trying to do as a business, the financial impact that can have in the business and how you need their support, legal is more likely than not to look for ways that you can move forward with your product um, development launches and you know anything else related to that while still keeping in mind CPA, the FTC, GDPR, um, and any other regulation that's coming up. And one of the simple ways, and I say simple and I'll put that in quotes, is having a data protection impact assessment and incorporating AI into those DPA, DPIAs. Okay, Katie, you, you know, what makes this whole area interesting from a compliance perspective, it's moving very, very quickly. Obviously, Europe wants to take the lead in AI governance, and, and that's a whole other debate. We won't go down there, whether they, whether they will or not. You know, obviously, we have a new administration coming in. How organizations sort of stay abreast of staying compliant on these risks? Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, it's hard because, as you say, it's moving fast. It feels like it's moving. I mean, it's fast as uh, policy ever moves, right? Which is not not actually that fast. Um, but so one of the things that I recommend right now as a, um, a, a really concrete place to start in terms of uh, ensuring that you're compliant with best practices is uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, which is a federal agency that develops standards, um, has put forth a risk management framework for AI. It's called an RMF risk management framework. Um, and it's a really, like, I think, pretty elegant way of thinking through social and technical risks together um, at many phases of the AI life cycle. And so this is the, because NIST, NIST is like, um, uh, CISA is, is not a uh, regulatory body, right? You don't have to follow what they said. It's voluntary, but it is, it, uh, you know, documenting your your processes and working through the risk management framework is a really good way to uh, to show that you are sort of demonstrating best practice as we know it today, um, which I think is one of the best things you can do as regulation changes, right, as an organization is to say, like, we are we are in good faith, we are trying uh, to to uh, to proceed with best practices until we are told, you know, by our lawyers, otherwise, I, I agree the comment on the policy, yeah, if, I think if I the can worst briefly thing you... add, sure. Sorry, if I may briefly add, absolutely agree with that. And it's something that regulators definitely pay attention to. <laughs> We always say that it's worse to have a policy you don't follow than no policy whatsoever. That's really going to get you in trouble if you have something that sits on the shelf. Gene, have you ever been in a situation where you're 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 waking up one day and saying, "Hey, this is great," except I'm not sure it's compliant. And and you know how do you how do you sort of message some of those, especially for organizations which are under a lot of pressure to get this generative AI app or environment going? Uh, that's like a daily thing because we are also a data provider. So it's a common, it's a thematic thing where we need to constantly worry about uh, whether it's legal, whether it's a good idea or whether or not it's something that we could actually use in our products. I think, you know, when, how do I word this? There's, when you're, when I, when I wake up every day, especially looking at what we're doing and what other people are doing, there is a lot to be said about what's academic versus reality. And, you know, when I speak with our customers as well, or in just in general, it's always about like, you know, I always try to explain to them like data equals knowledge equals intelligence equals power. 
and some of the motivator that in and it engages some individuals within company to let's say you know utilize the data for you know ai for wrong use or what insight do they get and what are they going to do with it i think there's I, I guess for me because i'm in the front line all the time and hearing about all this and some good and the bad you know i have a very obviously you know opaque response a lot of these things Emory, are, are we being smart from a technology perspective? I mean, is this not so much of a compliance issue? Is this really in part going back to the technology? Uh, technology and processes, right? It's not just technology. Technology will, oftentimes I see myself in, uh, designing processes for overuse of uh, technology or like underuse of technology, right? But, but one good thing about uh, this whole regulation thing is Hey, wait, I have other regulations that I have to follow too. It's not the first time I know this game. So again, uh, I'm going to go back to the same thing. Like we've done this before. I mean, we, we have other regulatory bodies that we have to make happy. Right. And then, uh, we have to follow certain standards and then that <clears throat> we, I hope you have a department that deals with that. If you don't, this is a perfect opportunity to build one and then, uh, run with those, uh, with those requirements. And then I'm a firm believer that. <clears throat> The more you build these controls, um, even for your side, right? for your sake, I, I think they almost 100, 120 percent overlap with with actual regulatory requirements. And then uh, these are good things to have, and uh, and also regulations want that want that too. And and just build those, and then you'll be fine. Uh, I'm a firm believer that if you're secure, you're most of the time compliant. Like it's it's uh, that's kind of similar to that. David, is it fair to say that if you, you follow some of the risk models you've been talking about, but that's naturally going to lead to compliance, or do we need to look at compliance separately? Interesting question, and I fully support my my NIST cousins up the up the road there in Gaithersburg. There, they and and I've done work. Uh, you know, I, I'm not always been CIS. I've been in and out of government, so I've been on the regulatory side, financial institutions, um, you know, large software organizations, cloud cloud organizations. I think that it's the best thing to put your back up against when it comes to proving that you are trying to do due diligence, right? And then, um, you know, does it does it ensure security? Um, I, I, you know, I don't know that RMF by itself does. It, it is the guidepost that gets you there. There is work that needs to be done, um, and and so I, the only thing I would say is it's it's a work in progress. Um, an example would be, you know, our common enumerated vulnerabilities, um, you know, the, the value there, if you actually follow some of the standards and you follow the risk management framework is you get to resolution of, of, of security events faster, in some cases, a magnitude faster. Um, I, I can tell you this, if you watch along with what we're doing on the CISA side with Secure by Design, it's, uh, it's all about getting you from the, from the RMF through to something that actually is functionally fit. And and will please your your you know your regulatory and your and your legal staff. So, I, I don't think that the that just the standards and the documentation gets you there. As I will quote uh, Doctor Doctor Ron Ross at NIST um, years ago when I heard him speak, um, uh, compliance never defended a damn thing. <laughs> but uh, but but I think it is the best basis um, for understanding and for common lexicons. So when you're talking to customers, you're talking to constituents, you're talking to your regulators, you all speak a common language. That means everything. One of the things that we remind our clients is that, is that uh, compliance is an inherently imperfect process. There's no such thing in the world of privacy and now in the world of AI governance of being perfectly compliant. One of the big debates we see the regulators having, I had a long conversation with the SEC about this is, do we, do we really need new rules, new compliance requirements for generative AI, or do we just need to beef up the existing rules? And I'm not sure the world's regulatory community has really addressed that. We know certain like Europe is obviously going more towards the former for new rules, but we'll see what happens with other organizations. But within that, one of, I, we think one of the most important things is, is we always use the term reasonable good faith efforts. We're trying to do the right thing. We're looking at the rules. We're working to implement it. We're testing it. We're auditing it. We're monitoring it. Are we perfect? No. And when we find mistakes, you know, we're remediating those mistakes. And too often, I think we we sometimes don't do anything because it feels overwhelming. And remember, these these are inherently imperfect. But generally, if you try and do the right thing and you follow these processes, we think you're going to be much less risk and and much safer for that. <laughs>